Frank up here to introduce our speaker. Again, I think we're in for quite a treat tonight. Um, you should all know, being with John tonight, uh, that our speaker tonight is from the Dallas area, but he is a Packer fan. I said, no, I never was. Uh, my parents got season tickets in 1960 when the Cowboys started. And as a little kid, you said, yeah, these guys are really boring. You know? But I, so I started really appreciating the teams that came to town. And I would always want to go see the visiting team. And from that, I got to see the very famous players, including Bart Starr's last game in Cotton Bowl before his retirement. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I want to thank every one of you for your time and your effort to be here. Hopefully, you'll hear something you hadn't before about Robert Lee or the Gettysburg Campaign. Since Last Chance for Victory came out in 2001, I've given more than 500 talks just on Lee at Gettysburg. Okay. And I can promise you none of them are ever the same. Uh, it's because um, you don't ever want to get stilted in your presentation where everything is the same and your voice sounds like it's the same. So I always try to have on an occasion like this, if anyone is in Chicago tomorrow, I promise you, you won't hear what we're going to talk about in detail tonight. There'll be some things of general, they'll be generalized, that's for sure. But I try to vary it up. Um, the other thing is, I love Q&A, and usually that's the best part of a lot of these uh, gatherings. So if there's any questions you've ever had about Lee's generalship, his career, or uh, Gettysburg in particular, please don't hesitate to ask um, once I'm finished running quickly through the images. The other thing I want to uh, experiment with is that <clears throat> If I move around like this, can everybody still hear me? No problem? OK, wonderful. Um, last chance for victory, Robert E. Lee and the Gettysburg Campaign, really the story of that takes place years and years before the War of the Rebellion or the War for Southern Independence or the Civil War or whatever you want to call it. What, it happens long before then. The stage is set, ironically, 15 years before the war even begins. Um, go ahead and let that go. The face <coughs> that everybody knew Robert E. Lee by when the war began was this face. This is what everybody knew Lee by. You know, he was not this gray haired, grandfather looking guy but rather what the women called the most dashing uh, bow ideal of a soldier you could possibly imagine, okay? Um, next. Erasmus Keyes, who served with Lee at the Board of Visitors for um, 
um, at West Point, and he served against Lee during the war as a federal corps commander in the Army of the Potomac, said Lee was exempt from every form and degree of snobbery, even though his sense of superiority and fitness to command were undeniable. Now think about that. He had this sense about him that he was fit to do whatever job he was set out to do. No man could stand in his presence and not recognize his capacity and acknowledge his moral force. George McClellan said that Lee on the battlefield was worth 40,000 men. That's a very similar statement to what the Duke of Wellington said about Napoleon, his hat being worth 40,000 men on the battlefield. Next now, when the, when the southern states began to secede, you saw this type of rhetoric, any fate but submission. They believe, they believe, the southern states believe that the Articles of, the Articles of Confederation that then became the Constitution and the, and the Confederation and the Federation of, of uh, States ratifications that came out after that, everybody understood that the states could secede from the federal government if they wanted to. This was a Jeffersonian belief that Thomas Jefferson mentioned in his first inaugural um, uh, speech. So this belief that you could secede from the Union was widespread in the South. Okay. Um, early in the war, um, when Lee, after he is the commander of Virginia's military forces, he's not given a job with the central government, but rather Jeff Davis lets him languish in his Richmond um, offices with really uh, without a job. And ladies and gentlemen, the reason why Robert E. Lee was never given a chance to command the army before he was thrust into that goes back into the Mexican War era, that 15 years that I was talking about. Because, go ahead, the next one. Because it was Jeff Davis, president of the Confederate States, hated Winfield Scott. Okay? Now the, the anima, the, the I shall say the, the basis of this animus uh, was because of a, of a disagreement that came about in Davis's mind between Winfield Scott and the other American Army commander that was Davis's former father-in-law, um, uh, Taylor, okay? And see, Davis had married Noxy Taylor before the war. She, they had a very, very brief marriage before she passed away but he stayed close to his father-in-law. And so when the Mexican War came and the fighting began, the two armies that were supposed to come uh, that merged down to Mexico, one from the east under Veracruz with Scott, the other one under Taylor in the north, and they were supposed to merge on Mexico. When General Scott took the reinforcements that were designated for Taylor's army, Jeff Davis never forgot it, never forgot it, never forgave it and anybody that was ever associated with Scott was painted with the same brush in Davis's mind. And everybody knows, probably here, that Robert E. Lee was Winfield Scott's protege, okay? So the very man that Abraham Lincoln wanted to command the principal army of the federal government at the outbreak of the hostilities, that very man is denied the chance to command south of the Mason-Dixon line until he was forced to, to let him command. Okay, it's, not, it's an irony of the war that the most capable man is kept out of the war for over a year. <laughs> so when Joe Johnston, the Army commander, uh, it gets wounded at Seven Pines, <laughs> May 31st, 62, it's Jeff Davis that is forced now to put Robert E. Lee in command. And on that was um, this, this painting right here, that's Davis and that's Lee. So on the night after midnight on, on June 1st, Lee is suddenly thrust in command of this army. <coughs> Lee, first duty he did the next day was issue the special orders. I just want to bring your attention to this phrase right here, conquer or die. 
because Lee adopted that as his motto. It's generally not known just how intense Robert E. Lee was at his core. You know, most of the mm, characterizations of Lee are almost fatalistic, very laid back kind of a guy. He was very intense and this was his motto. We see this time and again in his letters, in his orders to the troops, and in his general orders, okay? And we see it later in the reorganization of the army. Next. Of course, when Lee takes command, the army is really not an army. It was a, a, it was a collection of units that didn't even have discipline. Because in Joe Johnston's army, anybody could absent themselves anytime they wanted to to go into Richmond and party with the girls, okay? And so that, in and of, a turn, in and of itself, lent itself to, no, there was no discipline, there was no morale, and this is what Lee found when he ascended to command. Next, Lee. Oh, sure, there were companies of men that uh, had enlisted together. There were regiments from these states that knew each other from town to town. But there was no functional units really at the brigade level or higher, something that should have happened over the preceding fall. Next. So in the seven days, when Lee takes command, he starts um, implementing uh, a series of maneuvers that he repeats over and over and over and over and over and over again over the next hundred days. It is, he was taking it directly from Napoleon's operational plan called Maneuver sur la derrière, the maneuver on the rear, where you would take one uh, a detached wing of the army, this one under Jackson, you would try to move it down into the rear of the opposing army, thereby creating conditions that were favorable to the attacking forces. Uh, Lee's first victory at, at Gaines Mill, where we see John Bell Hood leading the Texas <coughs> Brigade that uh, broke the federal lines, next. And later in the campaign at Glendale, or known as Fraser's Farm, where Lee plans his battle exactly on a model from Hannibal Barca's Battle at Cannae. And if everybody knows the story of Hannibal in the Second Punic War, uh, he had this plan of battle where he would have these two jaws that, in, that merged and folded up the flanks of the Roman uh, consular armies. Lee planned his battle at uh, Fraser's Farm in White Oak Swamp exactly on uh, Hannibal's model. Next. But, with, but he was successful in eventually in driving the Federals away from Richmond. And the next thing to do was expose and expel the other the Federal forces from Virginia. After meeting with Davis and getting his permission, he decided that he would uh, um, uh, take the Army into what it was called Northern Virginia, where Lee had believed the Army should be operating always. In other words, Lee had a motto. It said the army, the, the capital, meaning Richmond, was never safer once the army was away from it, okay? In other words, if the, the way you defend a mobile place is you keep the army away from it, you don't let the adversary come to it. It's the, um, it's the mode of defense that was based on uh, Hannibal's, uh, Hannibal's defense of Carthage during the Second Punic War. In the second Manassas campaign, Lee again um, authors this broad turning maneuver, this time using Jackson, then followed by Longstreet, where the Federals in front of him would be bypassed by maneuvering on their rear and, and landing in the Manassas Centerville area. Okay? Next series of forced marches kind of epitomized Lee's modeling on Napoleonic ideas of, of, of soldiers winning battles with their feet. Next, the Battle of Second Manassas was desperate. The Confederates beat off federal attacks for two days until um, all the Confederates were concentrated there. And in, the, and in one of the most famous infantry attacks of the war, it was uh, Pete Longstreet launched this uh, attack on the Confederate right at the same time that Lee had ordered Jackson to pick up his defense and attack on the other side in order so uh, 
Um, Longstreet's wing could crush the Federal Army. Unfortunately, Jackson doesn't obey orders quickly. Uh, back, 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 back. Okay. And I'm, we'll go through that quickly. Okay, next one. Okay, there we are. Now we're going, now we're going forward. And the Confederates break the line, but they don't destroy the Federal Army, uh, but they give them a severe, a severe defeat. John Pope is replaced as commander. McClellan's put back in. Next. Levin decides to continue the war into Maryland by authoring a series of turning maneuvers again that uh, re eventually resulted in the capture of Harper's Ferry that was here and eventually the concentration at Sharpsburg, which is just over the river right there. Now, the reason that happened is because of the loss of Special Orders 191, which is a whole talk in and of itself. Next. Lee at Sharpsburg decides to stand. What's really amazing, and to give you an idea of how audacious he was, that his decision to stand was made when he had 17,000 infantry on the ground. The others were marching up from Harper's Ferry. And he knew in his face, George McClellan had over, at that time, had over 60,000 on the other side of the Antietam Creek. 17,000 guys on the ground and Lee's decided to stay and fight. Go ahead, next. This very bloody, bloody, very bloody day on September the 17th, 62, ends in a, uh, well, a tactical draw. Uh, the next day, Lee stays. He, uh, uh, he witnesses firsthand the tenacious defensive power of the Army of Northern Virginia. This is the Hood's Texas Brigade getting destroyed in the uh, in the wheat field with, ta with Jackson's botched counterattack that morning. Go ahead. But in the end, they held the line, and then overnight, next, that's uh, Longstreet and his uh, staff manning the guns of the Washington artillery is a famous story. That night, Lee decides that they were going to gather up all the stragglers and uh, the walking wounded and present a front for the next day rather than retreat. McClellan does not attack because all of his heavy ordnance had expended their artillery for the day. Next. So in the October reorganization, for after that, the Lee's army makes it back to Virginia. They then reorganize, and he then puts his, he, he has time to make his imprint on the army. Next. He designs this pincushion. We'll talk about it later, if you wish, that he comes up with the idea that Confederate law does not allow him to elevate a private to a corporal. He has no power of, of, of um, giving, giving authority to rank to anybody. All he can do is, under Confederate authority, is, and Confederate law is to suggest or make it, make it to where it's got to happen. So he decides, Lee decides, it's an interesting story, I'm going to take a minute just to give you an idea how he, how he tied the men to him and why they were so fanatically devoted to him, okay? He comes up with this idea of this pincushion presentation. Now, when Lee took command of the Army, he had already been thinking about this. He took, he had some Confederate gold. He sent it across lines into the Cincinnati area where there were lots of copperheads. And he had these pin cushions. They're about, th they're about this size double-faced, he had these pin cushions made, okay? And on the one side, it's the first national flag, and it says, what, Lee's motto, conquer or die. And on the other side, there's a scroll that says love that's framed by roses from Mary's Rose Garden at Arlington House, okay? Now, when he gets these uh, after the Maryland campaign, he starts going through the camps again, as was his uh, routine. And his staff had already done the work. They would call the deserving soldiers out, and he would present them with this pin cushion, thanking them for the service to the cause and, you know, reminding everybody that, you know, there was a lot more work to be done. Now, you can ask yourself, what is a soldier in the Army in Northern Virginia going to do with a pin cushion that on the one side says love? What do you think you're going to do with it? Send it to your loved one. That's right. And so typically what happened is the soldiers that 
had loved ones, mama, sisters, you know, cousins. They typically sent these back home <coughs> and with, typically with these letters that look what General Lee gave me. So in one, in one swoop, Lee does many things. He gives hope and support to the opponents of the Lincoln administration. He calls out the deserving soldiers of the army that are deserving of, of promotion, okay? And he also, and by that, he ties them in closer to himself because now they're, they have a lot of personal uh, um, interaction as he always has had with them. And the last thing he does, he gets the women to have their back <coughs> at the home front by sending this back home. It was utterly ingenious and it's one of the most amazing things that he did while his army commander. The next. The next campaign was Fredericksburg fought in the snow, uh, um, which there's another federal general involved. Uh, Lee is shown here on the front line scouting the federals. Uh, <clears throat> he wasn't like most army commanders. He was usually uh, very active in, along the front lines when the front lines were determined uh, where they were. In fact, a lot of people don't know that he was under fire in many battles. And as soon as he arrived at the battlefield of Second Manassas, with even out, without a staff officer while they're arranging for the troops to get deployed, he says, I'm going out to, to recon the federal positions. He comes back in a little while, and it looks like somebody had taken a lipstick marker and marked it across his cheek. And as he turned to his staff, he says, look, the Yan a Yankee almost killed me just now. And so uh, that is how close Lee got to the action, routinely. This shown here at, at Fredericksburg, a very famous um, uh, incident with Jackson, Longstreet, and himself getting uh, inside 800 yards of the federal positions to find out exactly what was going on. Next. Uh, Fredericksburg, uh, Lee wins a victory there, but nobody is happy with it on the Confederate side because there's no opportunity for maneuver that creates conditions to where the Federal Army can be destroyed piecemeal, which is always Lee's idea. Uh, uh, this is Longstreet's uh, guys along the stone wall there at Murray's Heights. Next. And even though he wins this important victory, there he is next to Longstreet, it's not at all what they need. They need knockout blows, not trading bodies two for one, okay? The spring of 63, Lee tries as best he can to keep the army together, even though it's starving to death by this time. Uh, when the spring campaign launches, uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville comes. This is a famous picture of, uh, that was done by Triani that shows Jackson and Lee at the, uh, at the camp <coughs> deciding uh, uh, to make that flank attack against the Federals. Um, the, uh, Lee splits his army in the face of a su numerically superior one, a, a, a really an audacious, <coughs> an audacious move that is studied in every military academy on the planet today. Um, and, go ahead, and Jackson launches this famous flank attack that crushes part of the Federal Army. Next. Next. Hooker winds up with his back up against the Ford here, another part of the Federal Army over here at uh, Salem Church. Next. By the, uh, the end of the battle, Lee has emerged as in the minds of almost everybody in the South as a great captain this famous painting by Guillermo. Next. In fact, Lee knows that with the demise of Jackson at, at Chancellorsville, he's got to reorganize the army. He then reshapes it, back one, and he reshapes it by uh, keeping Pete Longstreet as senior uh, corps commander as the first corps. Next, Dick Ewell is handpicked by Jackson uh, while Jackson's on his deathbed to be the uh, commander of the second corps. Powell Hill, also known as AP Hill, uh, shown here as a division commander, uh, had, uh, was the most promising of the division COs at that time. He's given command of the newly formed Third Corps. 
Obviously, Jeb Stuart is kept in command of the Confederate cavalry. Um, here is Lee and Stuart in one of their reviews before the uh, campaign began. Next. Now, <coughs> Lee's, Lee's Gettysburg campaign <coughs> is like his other campaigns. He's going to try to maneuver to create conditions favorable for himself and his army. And he then authors another turning maneuver, this time to swing the forces out into the west and, uh, and by stealing a march on the Federals, get into Pennsylvania where, assuming they can detect the Federals moving up to pursue them, they can pick and choose how and when to concentrate their army to take out the Federals piecemeal and win a crushing victory that will then have political impact uh, on the Lincoln administration. Uh, one of the most interesting stories um, in the Gettysburg thing, the one that you could probably spend an hour or two on in itself, is the detachment of Jeb Stuart's cavalry from the rest of the army. Uh, it was this guy right here, John Singleton Mosby, who uh, scouted the route for Stuart and his cavalry to detach from Lee and go pass through the Federals on their way into Pennsylvania. Next. Uh, Mosby shown here. Uh, understood what Stuart's orders were, that, they, that once they detached, if they met hindrance um, along the designated route, that they would both double back and go up on the other side of the mountains. Next. Of course, the guy who wrote the orders for, um, for Stuart's attachments right here is Charles Marshall. Um, he is the nephew of the famous John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States. He was a brilliant legal mind in his own right. Um, not many people graduate magna cum laude with a master's in English at the age of 18 from the University of Virginia. And some people claim, writing today, that this guy didn't understand the English language. Amazing. I wonder who doesn't understand the English language. Next. So Stuart detaches, uh, and as soon as he gets going, he runs into trouble. Uh, he runs into trouble in the, in the form of the entire Federal Corps under Winfield Hancock, is on the road that he is to take to the Potomac. So he has 5,600 cavalry troopers and six guns, and he runs into Hancock that's got 20,000 infantry and 80 guns. And by definition of his orders, he had run into hindrance of the most serious sort, but rather than obey what he was supposed to do, he even swings wider to the east and separates himself even more from Lee and the rest of the army. Beginning two days after Stuart's detachment, Lee, not having heard anything from Stuart, becomes concerned that things have gone awry. And sure enough, Stuart is deep into Pennsylvania, far uh, separated from Lee and the rest of the army when Lee needs him the most. Meanwhile, the rest of the army crosses the Potomac. Next. <coughs> Uh, they <coughs> temporarily capture um, uh, Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania. Next. When uh, word comes that uh, the Federal Army is in pursuit, um, Lee then orders Powell Hill right here to uh, coordinate with Dick Ewell, the commander of the 2nd Corps, where the, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia was to concentrate. He left that decision up to Powell Hill. They could either concentrate at Cashtown, shown here the Cashtown Inn. For many of you that go to Gettysburg, go that extra eight miles to see the Cashtown Inn. It's interesting to see, and you can imagine those dirt roads that led up to the pa mountain pass and the Confederate Army uh, coming down uh, that route. He left it up to Powell Hill where to concentrate, either Cashtown or at Gettysburg. Uh, it was Hill who told Ewell that we're all meeting, we're all going to concentrate in Gettysburg. This image here is Lee hearing the sound of the guns on the 1st of July, visiting with Powell Hill, wanting to know what in the world's going on, uh, as um, we got Dick Anderson's division right here passing by. Next. So as the finish, Lee finishes the interview, and then he's on his way to the front. And what we have then is this meeting engagement where the Federals <coughs> are coming from the south and from the east. The Confederates are coming from the west 
and from the north, Confederates converging on Gettysburg in this manner. <clears throat> okay. The first day, uh, the Confederates, because of the maneuvering that's involved with getting and concentrating these guys, they have a lot of opportunity that comes with that maneuver. They wind up, <coughs> they wind up uh, crushing the Federals that are on the west and north side of town in the First Corps and in the 11th Corps, next. And once that, once that route begins, it, it ends right here at Cemetery Hill. Now, <clears throat> arriving just as the debris of two corps are passing up the hill is Winfield Scott Hancock, who acknowledges in his writing that all the, federal, all the Confederates had to do was continue their pursuit and the, the day would have been theirs. They would have captured all the ordnance of First Corps, most of the 11th Corps. Um, the, the artillerist, the chief artillerist of the Federal First Corps said that he was certain that he was getting ready to go to Richmond as a POW. So Lee sees all this confusion. He sees the Federals retreating up the high ground through the town. And so he sends Walter Taylor, one of his ADCs, his, his oldest, I mean not his oldest, his longest tenured ADC, he sends him to Dick Ewell with a message. The message is, <clears throat> it is only necessary to press those people in order to secure possession of the Heights. You are to take them if practical. It has become popular in Civil War history circles to concentrate solely on these two words from Lee through Walter Taylor, if practical. But ladies and gentlemen, what does the message say? It is only necessary for you to do X. In, for, in order for us to achieve Y. That's basically what it says, okay? This right there was Tidewater type of uh, speak that was practiced by the, by the aristocrats of the period. You would give a man his direction and then say, I want you to do it if practicable. What if practicable meant was that you were to try, okay? But Ewell doesn't move. So Lee then sends an, another guy who had just come from Ewell with uh, Ewell asking, what kind of help am I going to get you know, attacking this hill? And Ewell's guys are 800 yards away from Cemetery Hill. Uh, the third corps that's coming up the road from the west, they're, they're, over, they're about a mile away. And so <clears throat> James Power Smith from Ewell's staff comes to the boss and says, uh, Ewell wants to know, you know what help you can give him. And Lee says, you know, I've asked Hill what he can give you. He can't give any infantry support now. I've ordered General Pendleton to put fire on the hill, and we can give you fire support from the artillery of the Third Corps. But other than the artillery support, I don't have anything. Go back and tell, whoop, missed it. Go back and tell General Lee Detective General Ewell, these words. General Lee directed me to return to Ewell, this is Smith, with the order to take Cemetery Hill if it was possible. <clears throat> and the only way it could be possible was, again, to try. But curiously enough, Ewell does not stir. Um, there are many uh, hypotheses as to why, but um, at the time that the order was given, uh, even the Federals on the receiving end of it said that all they had to do was just simply move forward. So <clears throat> not having uh, reached a decisive um, result at the end of the first day, uh, the Confederates have instead wrecked two of General Meade's, now General Meade's, um, seven corps. So they hadn't destroyed the Army, but they have certainly hurt very badly, two of them. In fact, it was the First Corps' last battle was Gettysburg. The 11th Corps was so badly handled that 
uh, nobody in the East wanted them there, and they were shipped out West uh, and participated in the Missionary Ridge campaign after, <coughs> after the campaign was over. But nevertheless, at the, at, the, at the beginning of the second day, the Federals are still on the field, and his army, Lee's army, is still concentrating. So Lee comes up with this idea, this battle plan, that pivots the plan at Chancellorsville instead of striking the Federals on the Federal right, they'll strike them on the left and come in this way, roll up Cemetery Hill and the Federal this way by moving in this direction. Next. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Meade is deploying his forces and unbeknownst to him, uh, Dan Sickles, commander of the Third Corps, moves his guys out from the, the line on Cemetery Ridge out to this this salient that's along the Peach Orchard and the Rose Farm, Stony Hill, and these other places, including Hawks Ridge. And when Lee, and when Meade goes over there to, to meet him, basically to say, you get, get ready to catch lots of lead because it's coming your way, because they could see just right across the way in just a matter of a few hundred yards, all the Confederates piling up and their batteries deploying, ready to really put it to, thir ready to, put it to Third Corps. Next. In the meantime, <coughs> Lee wants to get this battle underway as soon as Hood gets his division deployed. Hood comes up, deploys his guys, but he has this own idea of taking his division around the big top here, not this is round, little round top, there's a big top. He wants to detach his very fine division and move it hours this way before they move into position, which would take them out of the fight altogether for that day. Longstreet says no. The boss says we're going to attack. And uh, they begin the attack about 4 o'clock in a manner known as en echelon, which was a uh, in steps, meaning in French in steps, or in echelon, meaning this, you know, one, then another, then another. Then, in other words, like a stair step. And the reason that you did that is as old as Alexander the Great. Um, if you have an army that's inferior in numbers, but you're going to attack tactically, the most effective way of doing that is on echelon. Uh, uh, we saw uh, Alexander break the line, the Persian line at Gagamela using an uh, on echelon attack. Um, it was developed actually by uh, the generation that was before Alexander's father, mm -hmm. Philip. But it was something that Lee had studied, and he saw it work very effectively from the ancients to the moderns, and was something that he was familiar with. And it was a method by which the Army of Northern Virginia had tactically executed their attack since the very first day that Lee initiated his seven days offensive. His first counterattack, or his first attack in his career, was done tactically on the Allen Echelon mode. So it was a method by which the Army had an institutional memory to do, and officers understood how to do it, okay? Longstreet was very capable of doing that, and next. Uh, during the fighting on July the 2, next. Hood steps off the attack on Echelon, but because the Federal line had swung so far out this way that by the time the, uh, the two brigades on the end get onto their line. John Bell Hood is severely wounded, and the guiding hand for the division falls completely apart. It's hours before e McKeever Law, who is the senior brigade commander down here, is notified of Hood's demise, and by the time he gets to a centralized location, uh, the battle is already out of control insofar as the uh, executing the uh, the, turn, the turning maneuver here. So instead of really rolling them up here and going here, the Federals have already fortified a little round top, so that becomes a battle in and of itself. Texas Brigade attacked and rolled up Hawks Ridge. Next. Uh, they captured that, looking over to uh, uh, little round top here. This was known as the Valley of Death because of how many guys died down there. You can see right now part of... Uh, the Texas Brigade wearing out the 40th New York right here. Uh, this shows Rock Benning, who was head of Georgia Brigade, uh, directing his men. Next. Uh, but from Little Round Top is a wonderful view of the Federal artillery 
looking over to that, to that site we just saw. Go back, Larry, once. Go back. Right here is a federal, is a Confederates on, 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 uh, on Houts Ridge. You look across here to this artillery where it's right there. Go next. And that's the, that's the view back on the other side, okay? So uh, this, this independent battle begins almost for Little Round Top that has no significant uh, value other than it would be a, a nice place maybe to have a battery of guns, but it's sure, and it's gonna threaten, um, it's gonna threaten the, uh, the Hanover Road, but next, but you, other than the brigades pressing forward next, and you have uh, individual acts of heroism and, and battles between individual regiments next, it really doesn't amount to anything. This is uh, Oates's 15th Alabama. Right up here is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and his 20th May. Next. In the meantime, Longstreet is, is, is um, engaged the rest of his corps very skillfully. Um, uh, I believe it was after, soon after the, the, the battle, it was mentioned that probably no 15,000 men fought better that day than these two divisions under McClaws and Hood. And, and what they did, they managed to suck up 40,000 Federals onto them as part of Lee's plan to attack on echelon up the line. Because the advantage of doing that is that as you attack one part of the line, and you haven't done it down here yet, and as pressure is put here and here and here, these local commanders are going to call for help from the boss. And so Meade was sending reinforcements from his center down here to the south to stem Longstreet's tide, denuding his strength more and more and more into the center, where he unwittingly, at the time, was playing into Lee's hands who, because the on echelon attack had not yet reached the center. Next. So by the time the, the action is in full swing on the, on the south side of the field, this is Hood's <coughs> division and McClaws's. Next. Next. This is a, a picture of Barksdale and the Mississippi Brigade crushing the, uh, the Federals at the Peach Orchard and the Sherfy House salient. Next. Uh, there are Confederates that reach the center of the battle line on C Cemetery Ridge on the second, but they're effectively counterattacked because their own supports <coughs> under Posey and then General Mahone, which are right here, uh, do not advance as ordered. Posey lost control of his brigade. Billy Mahone back here uh, did not advance at all for God knows whatever reason because he was a pretty strange guy. Dick Anderson, who was a division commander, had a, his worst day of the war and didn't properly coordinate these two last two brigades. And as a result, the attack does not continue to tie down Federals along Cemetery Ridge because what was important is that right here was Dorsey Pender's Light Division, which is a very famous division, um, and opposing them were units of the Federal 11th Corps, which never won a tactical engagement in their entire muster history. Nevertheless, next. The fight for Cemetery Hill <coughs> takes place late that evening, next, with the Louisiana Brigade under Harry Hayes making a, a, a heroic charge up these hills, captures uh, the batteries on the summit, and had they been supported from the other end of the line, that was Pender that was supposed to attack, um, we might see have seen a whole lot different uh, result from Gettysburg ending on the second day. Next. But by the end of the second day, late that evening, about 11 o'clock, Stewart finally made it back to the boss's uh, headquarters. Now, <coughs> at the end, at the end of the, the first day of the battle, Lee, not having heard anything from Stewart, decided that he would find Stewart. So he called Harry Gilmore, who is commander of the 1st Maryland Cavalry Battalion, to descend to headquarters his 10 best riders that knew the countryside, inside and out. And he gave identical orders to each one of the 10 outriders that you were to go find Stuart and bring his command to Gettysburg. And when Stuart was at Carlisle, 
uh, shelling the barracks uh, late that afternoon. It was uh, the, the afternoon of the second, or uh, it was um, uh, Lee's riders that found Stewart rather than vice versa. They get recalled to Gettysburg uh, and Stewart um, made it inside the Confederate lines. Uh, evidently it was right after dark, but it took him several hours before he had the courage to go see the man <coughs> right here, giving him the thousand yard stare. Okay. The third day, Lee, <coughs> not having had a resolution the first two days, he does have an idea of how badly he has damaged the Federal Army. <clears throat> in two days, they've inflicted over 20,000 casualties, suffering in the same time, approximately 12, and that's why they were on the attack and not being properly coordinated. It was his belief that if everything got coordinated properly, if the commanders did what they were supposed to do, they could break the Federals and have some kind of resolution to the battle. Because you gotta remember that by the beginning of the third day, the water supplies were giving out everywhere in Gettysburg. Um, Lee's horses hadn't eaten for two days, and it was, it was a big chore to bring in enough water even for them to drink, having trucked it all the way from uh, the positions of March Creek that was behind the Confederate lines. So it was a logistical nightmare that uh, no resolution had been made, but then again, if you leave, you have lost, okay? So Lee made the decision that we're gonna stand and we're gonna fight again on the third day. He modeled his plan of battle after uh, uh, his reading, clearly, of um, uh, Marlborough's battle at Blenheim, and uh, you can see that very clearly in his, um, in his planning. One of the things I did <clears throat> when I was doing the Robert E. Lee at War series after Last Chance for Victory came out is that I thought that if I was going to do this series, I've got to read everything that is known that Lee checked out of the West Point Library or had in his li or had in his personal library. Okay, it took several years to do it, but once you have that frame of reference, once you understand, have knowing what he knew you can make the connection of how he is putting these pieces together and how he's modeling his decisions based on his knowledge, not only of the history's great captains, but also on his experiences in Mexico with Scott, okay? And by the time of the third day, he, he conjures up his initial battle plan where they were gonna strike him uh, on the Confederate left to, to, um, uh, to, as a diversion with Dick Ewell, and they were going to continue the attack in the same place where they uh, did on the second. However, that, that doesn't happen because Longstreet on the third uh, delays believing that they needed to maneuver rather than to resume the attack. In the meantime, Dick Ewell's guys are playing with their lives on the uh, the Confederate left and his attack eventually peters out next against the fortified positions of the Federals here on Culp's Hill, next. So Lee makes the decision with, even with Ewell's flank played out, to reorganize a new attack against the Federal Center or to cut bait and leave. But politically, he cannot stomach the idea of having to leave a battlefield if he hadn't been whipped, okay? So he decides to reorganize what is in front of the Federal Center, next, and strike it in the hopes that he can split it. And if he can just dislodge them, then he can perhaps have a victory that has significant political oomph, having won it north of the Mason-Dixon line, okay? The largest artillery barrage on the North American continent to that date is assembled. Go ahead. Uh, the troops are uh, selected for the attack. Interesting story. I'm, most everybody here has seen the film Gettysburg, okay? 
And there's this scene before the attack on the third day where Martin Sheen, is, as Lee, is, rides into the midst of all these Confederates and they just go nuts. You know, Lee, Lee, you know, they make this demonstration of affection. Well, see that, even though we know that that scene was not scripted, it just happened and the film, the, the, the guys with the film cameras were there to capture it. <clears throat> That's really based on fact because when Lee was re-scouting the line, the federal line, to see exactly what could be done, he came across uh, a Jimmy Kemper's brigade that was laid, there was, they were laying down on a swale uh, on the other side of the Emmitsburg Road. And as, there, as Lee is discussing this with Longstreet, Pickett, Harry Heath about, about this upcoming attack, uh, you know, there's some reservations from the subordinates about whether we can do this or not. And Lee says, well, ask the men if they can do it. Go ahead, ask them. And uh, the, the, the regimental COs in and, and Kemper's Brigade overheard this entire thing. And the next thing you know, it spreads like wildfire that they're going to attack the federal center. And there's this spontaneous demonstration. General Lee, we can do it. You know, we can do it. Send us in. You know, many of us will, will, will bite the dust today, but we will get this done. And it was on that demonstration of affirmation that Lee decides we're going to go ahead and do it. If the guys, the guys believe it, we're going to go ahead and do it. Longstreet's still not on, on, on board with it but he dutifully uh, gets the rest of the attack together. The, uh, uh, but the attack, as it turned out, was not the attack, as we know, that was ordered. Now, we, nobody in his right mind would think that you can send nine brigades of Confederate infantry, or some of it um, uh, chewed up from a previous day's fight, against ready and waiting uh, infantry, especially this one that's coming over a mile. Some of these guys were a lot closer. But um, it is clear from the staff officers and their interviews afterwards that a lot more was designed to happen that never happened. One of the most important things is that the Confederate artillery that was on this side of town that was supposed to be coordinated by uh, Pendleton never happened. And all that inflating fire that would have been coming down the line like this, heavily damaging the, conf the federal infantry from their flank, did not materialize. And so when these guys went in, even though battery after battery of federals were driven off here by Confederate fire, fresh ones were fed in. And when the uh, Confederates finally, re they actually reached the angle in the stone wall, but they certainly didn't have enough um, uh, with them to sustain that. Nevertheless, this is an image of, of Pickett's guys passing the Kadori house and ready to move up the slope. Next, uh, Garnett's uh, famous image on his horse right before the stone wall, leading his men forward, right? Next. Other way. All right, as a Confederate, this, this is where the angle is, where you can see Cushing's guns today, um, and how they had their last discharge right in the face of the Confederate infantry. This is Armistead, one of the brigade COs in Pickett's division, leading his guys over the wall and into uh, Armistead's battery. Next, another, just another view of Armistead. Meanwhile, to their left, uh, elements of the Confederates are reached near the, the Bryan farm, which is right here. Uh, but by this time, they're under so much damage that you can see their formations are falling apart, right? It's a close up of uh, the 11th Mississippi. Go ahead. And by the evening, after the survivors come back across the field, and Lee has told everybody that this was all his fault, he finally makes it back to headquarters. And this I think pretty well must symbolize 
a man as strong-willed as he was, how dejected and disappointed he must have felt, right? This famous picture of Confederate uh, prisoners at Gettysburg kind of has a different striking image than the opening scene in the film Gettysburg when you see the sentry stop Harrison on his way into uh, uh, in, in the Confederate lines, doesn't it? Well, anyway, these are hard, lean guys. Uh, these were uh, two of these were related. They were in the light division, uh, and they kind of symbolized the last uh, thrust of Lee into Pennsylvania and that gambit that was Gettysburg. Uh, one of Lee's most incredible feats was his retreat from Gettysburg and getting the army back uh, into Virginia. It was masterful and it is uh, certainly worth anybody's time to read about that retreat from Gettysburg. In the end, um, Lee offers his resignation to Davis, knowing, as Lee did, how much had depended upon a continuous Confederate success from Chancellorsville that had been building since the prior uh, Fredericksburg campaign. Um, he takes, like a man, he, at, at, of the time, his after action report completely shields all of his subordinates from any blame. It was intentionally crafted as such. And if you ever read his after action reports, you'll never see anywhere that there's a shred of, of um, finger pointing or blame placed at anybody's feet but his own. Um, this is just, so when we look at Lee, from now on, look at him in a different light. Not as the old gray man with the beard that um, obviously had the stress of an entire republic on his shoulders that had been shouldered on the bayonets of his army. But this guy right here that rode, into, rode the rails into Richmond in April of 61. Uh, this image was painted by Benjamin Franklin Reinhardt in April 1861 when Lee was in Richmond. Uh, the original is in the um, um, uh, Art Museum, oh gosh, the, 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 Norton, the Norton Art Museum in Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay, it's a magnificent painting. Now I use it as the Lee's the face of the Robert E. Lee at War series. Okay, and next is it. All right, so, what we take from Gettysburg is that Lee is trying to recoup this lost year that he had not being in command of the army, trying to replicate conditions that are favorable for he and his army to succeed. And by doing that, he was always seemingly scrambling to create those conditions. And ultimately, because of circumstance and um, the opponent's quality that was growing, that he was unable to achieve that at Gettysburg. When the campaign was over, uh, campaign um, uh, casualties were in favor of the Confederates because of the other actions that were connected to that, but the casualties suffered and the lack of su success at the end of the, of the battle rendered that Robert E. Lee's most bitter defeat. Ironically, a lot of people today, when they try to study Lee, only look at one battle, Gettysburg. And that's like looking at Napoleon only through the prism of Waterloo, okay? There was so much more to Lee than what we have at Gettysburg, but it was his last chance for victory. All right. Thank you very much. I'd try to get questions if I can. I'll get some questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. Does the elevator of coordinating troops, the artillery that he alluded to, coordination of units, do you blame that correctly on me who was out in front doing his The coordination? Uh, is this what day? 
Take, take the third day. Third day, okay. Um, question is, uh, the coordination of the artillery and the infantry on day three, the final attack, do I blame Lee? Well, Lee is responsible for the performance of his subordinates. Like a coach is responsible for the player's <coughs> performance on his team. But was he actually to blame? Well, it's a long battlefield. It's got lots of different elements, and that's why he had, de that's why he had delegated um, responsibilities to Longstreet and to others. Now, after the war, there's all this bickering back and forth about who's responsible for this and who's responsible for that, and Alexander shouldn't be responsible for ordering in the infantry. That should be Longstreet's job. Uh, what's clear about it 